Um, welcome everybody. Uh, it's been a long couple of days, but just a wonderful couple of days. But we've packed so much into this that some of you might have forgotten, forgotten what, what I, I said, said right at the beginning of the conference. Um, welcome remarks. I, I said that there would be an announcement. Remember that? You remember that? Couple people were, so we're now at that point. That is now going to happen. But first, before I make this little announcement, um, oh my gosh, it's been like way too many hours since I have thanked Allison Smythe and since I've thanked Mackenzie Tor. We all give them just a few. It's just so remarkable. I've said it before, Allison has put in like a 15 hour week out of state from the UK and just jumped back into this, working on a weekend back. We're so, we're so grateful. Um, and, and Mackenzie, the, the, the good spirit and humor that you had the whole time we were doing this has even come through even more in this last couple of days. I'm very, very grateful. I also want to add Bailey Martin to the applause. She uh, helped, helped out like, you know, we did uh, last night and we did run around today as well. So we're, we're very grateful. Um, I didn't say in my welcome remarks because I was saving it for now, but there's a couple of our partners on the British side that have put a, a lot of work into this, um, and they should be recognized. Uh, first, Dan Peart. Dan, you want to raise your hand? So, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, it's sort of like, you know, the criminology, what happens on the other side on the branch committee work and what the distribution of labor is, but I do know this. Whenever I have a a branch related question i email dan and it's guaranteed no matter what time it is in the uk he responds in like five minutes it's unbelievable and also always in good spirit but dan would helped this you know two or three years ago when we were first um envisioning it and it's been along all the way so we're very grateful um and then also emily west um emily it's just been fantastic to work with you on this um, those of you on this side probably don't know, but Emily has been part of Branch. Well, maybe not since the very, very beginning. Um, much, much too young, um, much too young, but has been such um, an indispensable part of that organization. Worked for many, many, many years um, as the Branch Secretary. He's always been on the committee. He's gone to every conference, and it's absolutely wonderful to see you now. Um, at the head of the organization. And I must apologize how Americanized I've become. I put in the program that she's the branch president. Um, that, but there is no branch president. I, I've been told she's the branch chair. Um, so we, th we thank you. One more thing about Emily, and this will get me to the announcement, was that um, Emily probably didn't know that in the, in the Midwest, um, all serious business is done over breakfast. Over breakfast. So very different from England. Uh, where all serious business was done over wine late at night. Here you do things first in the morning. And so the very first day she was here, 
had a breakfast at a truck stop with John Freimeyer, the um, Mizzou Director of Graduate Studies, and Emily. And we worked on um, a kind of a vision, hammering out an idea that we've had about how we can use some of the momentum from this conference to um, help promote um, both the diversification of uh, graduate work on American history here at Mizzou and within Branch, and then also just continuing the Atlantic uh, project. So I'm very happy to say that uh, we have a, a, a vision in principle. Uh, this will we'll have to approve it on this side, which there won't be. I don't anticipate any problems for a graduate fellowship on an annual basis to be offered um, at Missouri in our MA in Atlantic History program to a student um, selected from a branch process, um, a, a British student with a strong preference um, for a, a, a British, Asian, or minority ethnic student to come on a fellowship, to be a, a teaching assistant here in Missouri, and to take our one-year MA program. I'm very excited about this um, possibility. Look forward to working um, with, with Emily and, and branch colleagues in, in promoting this initiative and, and, and recruiting candidates, and then also working with colleagues here um, to, to help make that experience for the student as important as possible. And I'd like we give a round of applause to John Freimeyer, um, who really, <laughs> really, really kicked into gear. Um, um, to help make this happen, very, very grateful for, for all that you've done, John. And John's been, he's just coming to the end of his tenure as the Director of Graduate Studies. So he'll have a well-deserved break from all this uh, sort of stuff. But he's been a huge supporter of our new MA program um, in, in the Kinder Institute from the History Department side. And I'm very grateful, very grateful for that, John. So the last thing I'm just going to say is um, my standard line, the special relationship. I'm one of those old kind of softies that actually believes in it. Um, and the reason why I believe in the special relationship is because I, I, I don't think the special relationship is about prime ministers and presidents. Um, I don't think that it's about, you know, retired colonels and Boeing executives and washed up civil servants. That's not what the special relationship is to me. It's us. It's, it's people. Um, it's the connections, the networks, and the social institutions that connect, uh, uh, span the Atlantic. And if we can do our part to make sure that those networks don't simply reflect social hierarchies of power in both countries, but provide opportunities um, that reflect the, the true demography of both of our nations will be a much better place indeed. So thank you all very much. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Emily to announce our speaker, or to introduce our speaker. Um, thank you so much for that, Jay. Um, Jay likes being up on stages like this, unlike me so much. Um, so I'm going to keep my comments very brief. And thank you, Jay. You've actually spared me doing lots of thank yous. But of course, the one person you couldn't thank in all this process was yourself. So can we have a round of applause for Jay? I mean, you and the Kinder Institute have just been so incredibly generous to us as an organization. Um, we live in really horrible times, don't we? And yet this conference has been so uplifting, you know, catching up with old friends, meeting new ones. Um, I'm increasingly thinking that as much as I really, really enjoy the intellectual content of conferences, it's those spaces in between the opportunities we have for socializing and you know, yeah, making new friends that are so important. So you, you've been really, really fantastic, Jay. And um, yeah, again, we're incredibly, incredibly grateful for, to, to you and the Kinder Institute for all you've done, as well as the history department and um, staff involved there as well. So thank you. Um, I also wanted, um, while I have the floor, just to do a quick plug. Um, apologies to the lovely gentleman at the back who I just alarmed saying, can you just bring up this extra web page for me. Um, if you go to this web page, which is the, um, the homepage of British American 19th century historians, you will see here um, a link to our next conference, um, which takes place in October in Leicester. If you think you might like to see us again and be involved in this organization, then do please feel free to submit a proposal. Um, thereafter, if, this is, if it all feels a bit too soon, we're having our 30th anniversary con conference next year at the University of Oxford, kindly hosted by Adam Smith. 
So do please take a look at the web page and we'd love for you to submit a proposal, come and join us on the other side of the pond if you so wish. Okay, so um, I'm supposed to be here introducing Richard, um, which I'm, I'm now going to do. Um, I've known Richard Carwardine for many years and um, I was going to say that he's an historian um, of American religion and politics in the 19th century, but it feels like a real understatement. In many ways, he is the historian of religion and politics in the 19th century. And I don't even mean the British American historian, he's just the historian of these themes. Um, Richard um, is an Emeritus Rhodes Professor of American History at the University of Oxford former president of Corpus Christi College there. And he also spent many years um, at the University of Sheffield before, before the Oxford draunt. He's most known for his prize-winning works on Abraham Lincoln, including some edited work with um, Jay as well on the global Lincoln. So do take a look at that if you haven't already. Um, from a more personal perspective, I've known Richard for many years and he's such a wise and generous man with his time. He's always got time when you need to speak to him about something, full of sage advice about branch, about um, taking our organization forward. And I'm so grateful to the time he spent with me for that, especially um, during lockdown when we got to know each other a little bit better via Zoom. Um, Richard is also a thespian. Learn more about that by going to Wikipedia and finding out about him. And one thing that I've been thinking is that you know, good actors actually make really, really good historians because they're so good at public speaking, unlike me, um, which I don't like this at all. Um, Richard is a wonderful public speaker, full of confidence. And um, I was thinking back to, I think it must have been your inaugural lecture in Oxford where I first witnessed just how terrific you were. Um, so we're in for a real treat this afternoon. Um, today's talk's going to be about religious nationalists in the age of Lincoln. And over to you, Richard. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, th thank you very much, very much Emily. That's, um, uh, that's got a lot to live up to now. <laughs> uh, but uh, let me, I'll be very brief, but I do want to echo the thanks uh, that's already been expressed to Jay, Mackenzie, Alison, um, to, to Daniel, to, to yourself, Emily, um, for the whole team for bringing this uh, conference to fruition. I also want to thank all the presenters over the last two days. I had a whale of a time. I'm absolutely exhausted, I have to say, <laughs> but intellectually, it's been so, so stimulating and every contribution has held my attention and I've learned something from. So thank you for that. This morning's sessions actually uh, raised the issue of uh, emotional style and um, when Jay cancelled the 2020 conference I made a vow uh, in the spirit of the Missouri gorillas not to cut my hair <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see I've been completely true to my word um, and as for, for clothes as a matter of emotional signaling uh, I want you to know that my red outfit is not what you might think in these parts um, as my uh, fellow countrymen, fellow country folk, I should say, David Sim, uh, and our esteemed chair, Emily, will confirm I am sporting the color of my favored, uh, the color favored, I should say, by all patriotic people from Wales, uh, my native land. So I'm being Welsh today, uh, not American red. Okay. Um, I'm aware that I'm the, uh, I, the person, and my talk stands between you, um, the hog roast, and uh, Richard Blackett wielding a very large knife. So uh, <laughs> I will get on. At the morning of Saturday the 4th of March, 1865, the day of Abraham Lincoln's second inauguration, thousands thronged Washington streets under dark clouds. Cheers accompanied the presidential carriage, taking Mary Lincoln and son Tad to the Capitol, escorted by African-American troops. The president was already there, signing bills. His business done, he emerged to face an audience of some 30,000 on the eastern frontage. One observer marveled, thousands of colored folk, heretofore excluded from such reunions, were mingled for the first time with the white spectators. To music and cheers, Lincoln took his place on the platform. At his first inauguration, he had appeared vigorous now he had 
a reporter noted, the look of a man on whom sorrow and care have done their worst. Yet he had cause to be cheerful. The war had ended its final phases very clearly. The Union's capture of Fort Fisher in mid-January had neutralized the Confederates' last blockade-running port. William T. Sherman's troops, after cutting a swath through Georgia, were marching north through South Carolina, where the Union flag once again flew over Fort Sumter. That army would soon join up with Ulysses S. Grant, who was closing on Lee's beleaguered armor, army in Virginia. The political outlook was encouraging too. Six months earlier, Lee, Lincoln's prospects of re-election had looked bleak, but the fall of Atlanta changed the political weather. Vindicated at the polls, Lincoln set about driving an emancipation amendment through the outgoing Congress, an act of political determination that he brought to fruition in January. By then, new constitutions in Maryland and Missouri had ended slavery in both states, a development followed in Tennessee in February. So electoral triumph, military progress, and the death spasms of slavery gave Lincoln a sense of presidential authority he had never previously enjoyed. The oath of office taken, Lincoln delivered a speech whose matter-of-fact opening paragraph was followed by three rich in concentrated meaning and striking rhetoric. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. The first of these summarized, even-handedly, the process by which the nation had fallen into war. Lincoln avoided assigning blame for the conflict. All sought to avert it. Both parties deprecated war. The next paragraph comprised over half the speech and offered a, a causal explanation of the war. The slaves of the South constituted a peculiar and powerful interest all knew that this interest was somehow the cause of the war. To strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war, while the government claimed to do no more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. The war had developed into a struggle whose dimensions neither party expected. And then follows a sentence launching the speech in a direction few expected. Both parties read the same Bible, and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. The address took a striking religious turn, one that revealed the depth of Lincoln's theology about God's will and his divine judgment on the American nation. Lincoln had already established himself in the public mind as a man of faith. His listeners would not have been particularly surprised that his speech made 14 mentions of God, quoted four times from scripture and talked about prayer on three occasions. Nor that he drew on the book of Genesis and Christ's Sermon on the Mount. It may seem strange that any man should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other man's faces, but let us judge not that we be not judged. This is an example uh, of rhetorical paralypsis, uh, a means of emphasizing something by purporting not to notice it. But Lincoln, I think, was not here making a sly dig at the South. Rather, he followed with a statement that formed the theological center of the whole speech. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. And in this way, Lincoln prepared his audience for a passage that made the whole nation complicit in the sin of slavery, one to which I'm absolutely certain you're more than familiar. Woe unto the world because of offenses. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which in the providence of God he now wills to remove and that he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came, shall we discern therein any departure from those divine attributes which the believers in a living God always ascribe to him? And notice Pierre Lincoln's allusion to a God that is present in human affairs, not a remote providence. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills it, it continues until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with a sword and lash shall be paid by another drawn with a sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. So the nation's complicity in the sin of slavery opened the way for Lincoln's memorable concluding paragraph echoing the words of Malachi. 
with malice toward, one, but toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. At this point, Lincoln took the step forward to take the oath of office and the sun broke through the clouds, seemingly an act of divine blessing on what he had just said. And Lincoln's unique address poses the question, why did he turn his political platform into a clergyman's pulpit? Attending to the religious meaning of the war revealed his personal ruminations on faith, but the address was not a personal act of confession. Rather, it was a striking statement of the deep interpenetration of religion and politics during the nation's struggle for existence and the crystallizing of its identity. The American Civil War was not a war of religion in the same way that the bloody French religious wars of the 16th century pitted Protestant against Catholic, or the subsequent Thirty Years' War grew out of a similar struggle within the Holy Roman Empire. But it was a religious war in its shaping of 19th century nationalist impulses within the framework of contending Judeo-Christian beliefs. And so, in the time available to me, and it'll have to be pretty cursory, I'm going to take up a number of related issues. The varieties of American religious nationalism in the early republic and the country's space for plural faiths. The moral dimensions of slavery, their meaning for national righteousness, and their role in the fracture of the nation. The power of religious definitions of the American nation to mobilize and to sustain political support. And above all, I shall ask you to recognize how impoverished and inadequate is our understanding of the American Civil War if we do not respect it as a battlefield of contending religious nationalists, of bloody outcomes not only between the North and the South, but as Lincoln knew only too well, within the North itself. A fusion of Christian piety and reverence for the independent republic developed naturally out of the American revolutionary struggle. In a torrent of rhetoric, Presbyterians and New England Congregationists in particular deemed the events of the revolution, the forging of intercolonial unity, the emergence of Washington as a leader, the crushing of a mighty foe, took these events to be hard evidence that the God who had guided their Puritan forebears was now lavishing his favor on the new nation. Moreover, through America's Republican institutions, God was establishing a model for the world, perhaps even preparing the way for the promised land of the latter days. God, the Methodist John Dow declared, had done great things for us in our national capacity, but future blessings depended on recognizing that only righteousness exalteth a nation, that sin is a reproach to any people. A reproach to any people. That scriptural text was ubiquitous and would remain so. These sentiments were insufficient, however, to align American churches behind a single form of religious nationalism. The unique ecclesiastical makeup of the United States was too fractured for that. The separation of church and state erected a religious political order unique in Western history. America's astonishing proliferation of religious groups had steadily undermined the case for the legal privileging of, partic of particular traditions. Christianity in the colonies was far more institutionally diverse than in any contemporary European society. To the Baptists, Presbyterians, Quakers, Anglicans, and Seventh-day Baptists who challenged congregational hegemony in New England, we can add the groups which a greater ethnic mix had sustained in the Middle and Southern colonies. German Lutherans, Mennonites, Moravians, French Huguenots, Dutch Reformers, Sephardic Jews, as well as Scottish and Scots-Irish Protestant traditions. The late 18th and early 19th century witnessed further diversity. Universalists, Unitarians, Millennialist Shakers, Roman Catholic arrivals, and most significantly, swelling numbers of New Light Baptists and Methodists. Methodists who, by 1830, were the biggest church in the country. A plural Christianity meant contending ambitions, reflecting sharp differences of doctrine and the disparate influences of region, race, class, and ethnicity. 
what constituted national righteousness was not a matter of agreement. The Orthodox, who battled against unrighteous Catholicism, Unitarianism, Deism, and the de-Christianizing potions of the French Revolution, were themselves deeply, fra deeply fractured. Predestinarian Calvinists contended on one side with staunchly Arminian Methodists, and on the other with Anglican-style moralists cool towards evangelical conversion. Episcopalians rebuked Quakers for their social radicalism, and Baptists lambasted Methodists for their alleged crypto-Romanism. Contention over the proper observance of the Sabbath, the claims of teetotalism, the rights of the Native American population, the claims of adult over infant baptism, religious perfectionists' pursuit of sexual freedom, Mormon polygamy, all were attacked and defended by contested measures of righteous purpose. The bloodiest landmarks of these hostilities included anti-Catholic riots, arson and murder in Boston, Philadelphia and Louisville, and the assassination of the Mormon leader, Joseph Smith. This unique proliferation of religious identities has led one commentator to remark that America had the potential to be as great a religious battleground as had existed in the course of Western civilization. Yet, as a visiting English Methodist reported, American society was not convulsed, nor the state put in jeopardy by religious contentions, claims, and projects. That the torching of convents and the murder of religious misfits remained the exception, not the rule, had something to do with the homogenizing effect of the religious marketplace, as churches promoted revivals and chased converts during the sustained surge, particularly evangelical surge, from the 1790s to the 1830s, and a degree of interdenominational borrowing and cross-fertilization occurred. At the same time, evangelical churches across the Protestant spectrum found in the model of British voluntary societies a form of interdenominational association which further strengthened the national ligaments of Protestantism, such as the American Bible Society, American Tract Society, American Temperance Society, Temperance Society and so forth. In the 10th Federalist paper, James Madison argued that republics were best protected against the selfishness of its various factional interests, often economically impelled by their multiplication to the point that no single faction could dominate the polity. This was a, a purpose, perspicuous understanding of how a political society might harness selfish interests through forced compromise for the benefit of the common good. The founders equally understood that a similar sectarian pluralism would prevent the triumph of a single religious faction. And this was indeed how things developed. The sects and denominations of the early republic tolerated pluralism, not because they believed diversity was in itself a good thing, but because there was no realistic alternative. The most powerfully powerful, the most powerful sought ascendancy had ambitions to scatter what the Methodist polemicist Parson Brownlow called unregenerate adversaries. But in practice, the best that any denominational family could hope for was to become an informal establishment in one subregion or another. The integrative function of religious diversity was also encouraged by the Republic's abundance of cultural space, which allowed each denominational group to set righteous national bearings on its own individual terms. Whether they were mainstream Protestants or those they dismissed as outsiders, each religious grouping cherished the freedom to stamp their image on the United States. Outsider groups like the Mormons and Catholics fed on their status as victims, as righteous victims and martyrs to assert a patriotism and a love of American ideals they could not see in their persecutors. During the early decades of the Republic, then, the very multiplicity of American religious groups and their cultural and political expressions generally worked to prevent the development of a single line of fissure could, that could threaten national integrity. Each family of churches had space in which to fashion its own notion of a righteous America. The features that helped the nation accommodate contending expressions of national righteousness, of course, had their breaking point. The fracture came, of course, through the growing conflict over slavery. 
The collapse of the early republic's broad national consensus over Christian slaveholding took institutional form in the schisms that shook the countrywide Protestant churches from the late 1830s to the onset of civil war. This is a complex story, but at its heart was the conflict between two sides, each convinced of their own irreproachable virtue. Those opposed to slavery, paving an ideological route that many in the later Republican Party would follow, saw their cause as one of the changeless, eternal right of humanity and justice and righteousness. Pro-slavery millennialists of the South, for their part, were utterly sure that they upheld God's institution. Not without a, a measure of smug self-righteousness, they repeated a litany, as a litany, that Old Testament society was founded on it. God had sanctioned Negro slavery or the bondage of the Canaanitish descendants of Ham. Under the new dispensation, Christ and his apostles, living and working where it existed under Roman law, fixed the duties of masters and slaves as precisely as they did those of parents and children, rulers and subjects. The slave owed obedience to the master, the master humanity to the slave. The presidential election of 1860 saw the victory of a Republican party proud to celebrate the support of anti-slavery Protestants impelled by obedience to a higher law to nurture and sustain a moral republic. Lincoln's victory prompted the final act in the pre-war drama of national disintegration, the secession of the Lower South and the formation of the Confederacy that owed much to the political ministrations of millennialist pro-slavery clergy. Southern Protestantism fashioned a framework that gave religious meaning to the political separation that its leaders had encouraged. For radical pro-slavery Christians, their churches purged of, of subversive error by the denominational schisms, political secession was an act of purification, allowing the righteous to withdraw from fellowship with the ungodly. The crisis could be interpreted as a divine visitation on the unrighteous nation but one that proffered a means of new birth, sacred and secular. A New Orleans minister defined the South's providential trust, the duty to ourselves, to our slaves, to the world and to Almighty God to preserve and transmit our existing system of domestic servitude wherever providence and nature may carry it. The conflict that ensued was not a war to exterminate a religious infidel or to impose religious uniformity, yet both sides attached religious purpose and meaning to the conflict and saw themselves engaged in a fight to prevent what the southern pulpit called the perversion of our holy religion and northerners the victory of pro-slavery atheism. Religion shaped the moral framework that sought to accommodate death and suffering, triumph and disaster, some of the most vivid images are those of a sanctified war. 5,000 Union troops accompanied by regimental bands singing, praise God from whom all blessings flow, as they march through Georgia. Union coins newly engraved with the words, in God we trust. Thousands of troops accepting complete immersion in mass baptisms. Religious leaders were as stirred as their secular counterparts by the fracture of the country. Their language often mirrored that of the political class. At the same time, religious communities, North and South, shaped political discourse with its assertion that the hand of the Almighty was at work. The scriptures became an explanatory manual. A Connecticut Baptist reflected, this national adversity makes the Bible almost equally the textbook of the soldier and the minister at the altar of the camp and battlefield and of like authority in questions of civil as of ecclesiastical interest. In a war concerning national integrity and the future of slavery, religious interpretations of the respective roles under providence of the Union and Confederacy gave definition, authority, and energy to patriotism on each side. Religious nationalism, in other words, provided sustaining ideological fuel during a struggle that engaged millions and would claim over 700,000 lives. There is an important and powerful story of Confederate religious nationalism. From the outset of the war, the vast majority of Southern Christians regarded an independent Confederacy and its righteous army as the only patriotic answer to the atheistic fanaticism and tyranny of the infidel North. 
by combining the preaching of Jeremiads with the ritual of public fasting, the Southern clergy pursued a novel theocratic course, one made all the easier by the explicit Christian identity that a God-invoking constitution gave the Confederacy. Their articulation of the Confederacy as a godly polity was an essential element in the crystallizing of the Confederate nation. This afternoon, however, I'll, I'll show how a majority within the dominant religious communities of the North, overwhelmingly Protestant and evangelical, carried an ideology of righteousness into their war for the Union, how they urged it upon the Lincoln administration and how Lincoln himself measured unfolding events against the standards of scriptural authority. I shall also explain how Lincoln's powerful domestic opponents on the home front, outraged by the increasingly revolutionary war and convinced of their own virtue, took refuge in a conservative religious reading of the, nature, of the nation's righteous purpose and values. At Lincoln's call in April 1861 to put down the rebellion drew a majority of Northern Christians onto a common unionist platform. Pre-war conservatives, whose national priority had been conciliation between the North and the South, now united forces in a great people's war for Christian democracy. With those higher law anti-slavery radicals they had previously rebuked for threatening the American project. This was an initial unity qualified by a few principled pacifists and other dissenters, but the majority of Northern clergy trumpeted their support for a war fought to prevent national annihilation. One editor doubted if in the history of the world so many pulpits had thundered against rebellion as on the last Sunday of the first month of the war. That the North's wartime patriotism retained so much of its vigor in the face of the growing carnage owed much to the thousands who delivered the scriptural case for a war of national salvation from their pulpits, periodicals, and mass circulation newspapers. Most evangelicals continued to hold to their pre-war conviction that it was their nation's role to effect the conversion and perfection of the world before Christ's return to reign on earth. This optimistic post-millennialism, no better articulated than in Julia Ward Howe's Battle Hymn of the Republic, formed a staple of the steady outpouring of addresses that became a rhetorical flood on those days, and there were nine of them in all, that the Lincoln administration set aside for national fasting, humiliation, prayer, and thanksgiving, designed to encourage a religious reading of the nation's purposes. One Chicago described the combined preaching on national fast days as, and I quote, a flank movement on God by the Christian North. Nations, American Protestants learned from scripture and history held an essential place in God's moral economy. To look upon a nation as left to itself, to take its own course without reference to the divine will, is an atheistical sentiment, insisted a Congregationalist pastor. Scripture showed that God, so far from having nothing to do with the nations of the earth, has everything to do with them. Their prosperity, their adversity, yeah, their very existence is declared to be dependent on his will. And he builds them up for their righteousness and casts them down for their wickedness. Few conceded that the American Union was destined for imminent destruction. Indeed, God had chosen the United States for a particular role. If there is a country on the map of the world truly favored of God, it is our own America insisted one representative preacher. In the finest territory on the face of the globe, with unequaled wealth and promise, America had reached a state of advanced civilization, separated from the discordant elements of the old world. Americans enjoyed the richest inheritance of civil and religious freedom ever bequeathed to any nation in ancient or modern times. They were led by a government uniquely humane, wise and just, one founded upon popular rights and blending strength with liberty, the best government that was ever constituted since the world began. Now, that's a quote, of course. <laughs> American Protestant preachers celebrated churches untrammeled by alliance with the state and enjoying a spiritual prosperity unparalleled in history. American Christianity, uncorrupted by tradition and born of the Reformation and the Puritans, was unique, shining in purity when compared with the moral desolation of Mohammedan Asia the petty states of the African race, papal Italy and Iberia, and semi-infidel France. The territorial spread of American Protestant institutions signaled a blessing 
analogous to the experience of Israel of old. As a latter-day Israel, America took on universal significance, serving the welfare of the whole human race. A Methodist editor told his readers they were fighting for the peace of future ages, for free government in our land and in all lands for all ages to come. Ancient republics stand on the page of history as discouraging failures, and the modern republics have gone down in blood. Our government was organized by wiser men who had the conservative element of Christian faith to give stability to their work. If the government they set up is cast down, when may mankind be expected to repeat the experiment? Confederate success would mean republicanism would lose its hope throughout the earth. Since the Confederacy represented the vilest treason ever known since the great secession from heaven, which of course dispatched Jefferson Davis to the same quarters as Lucifer, then the question arose, why was God putting the whole nation through this time of trial? Many saw the war as a testing process of discipline, one characteristic of America's history. As Israel had been chastised to purge corruption, so the rigors of the early colonial settlements and the revolution helped to purify the American nation. The crisis of civil war marked an advanced stage in a program of divine purification from sins. But what specifically were those national sins? Jeremiah has commonly lamented the haste to be rich, widespread political corruption, and the neglect of religion. But what above all explained the nation's paroxysm was its complicity in slavery. By the time of the first National Fast Day in September 1861, following the early military setbacks, this would be a growing theme. This fearful crisis, Albert Palmer insisted, this tragedy of treason and blood is the fruit of our dallying with temptation, with the dark national sin of human enslavement. Yet whatever God's punishment, there were no grounds for despair. Out of the severity of war, the Presbyterian William Shedd believed, would come a solid and well-compacted growth as men of the most diverse social, political, and religious sentiments of all classes, conditions, and opinions rallied with the unanimity of a single mind. This consolidated America would be a transfigured nation. And Congregationalist Homer Dunning fused Christ and the Union. I rejoice to be with the Union when in its Gethsemane it sweats its great drops of blood, and on its Calvary it is crucified by its own children. Our children and children's children will speak of 1861 as we speak of 1776. And when the nation shall have overmastered the monster of slavery and shall stand up transfigured with divine beauty, men will give thanks to God for this great and sore trial. Dunning's words reveal that many moderately anti-slavery Protestants who had been critical of radical abolitionists before the war soon saw that the logic of events called for an assault on slavery. They agreed that the army had the right to liberate the slaves used by the enemy to dig trenches, build fortifications, and work artillery. And in time, many conservative Protestants too would see Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation as a legitimate weapon of war. These Protestants' understanding of events culminated in the certainty that, as one put it, God is with us. The Lord of hosts is on our side. How could God possibly smile upon rebellion, treason, and a, a nationality with slavery as its cornerstone, asked another. This was, of course, a scornful allusion to Alexander Stevens' pre-war celebration of the Confederacy's unique racial purposes. Some warned against hubris and self-righteousness, but mostly the appetite for self-criticism coexisted with a belief in the North's moral superiority. Its, stains, its, sorry, its sins were stains that could be cleansed by washing. The confederacies were systemic evils removable only by destroying the body itself. The Methodist George Peck declared, the, the war is a necessary and righteous war for the defense of our nationality. It is a war of civilization against barbarism, of liberty against slavery, of order against confusion, of right against wrong. If ever the sword was drawn in a holy cause, it is so in the present war of the United States government against the great Southern Rebellion. Religious leaders sought to impress on the president their ideas about the religious meaning of the American nation. They lobbied him throughout the war. 
Lincoln hosted frequent meetings with ministers across the Protestant spectrum, as well as with Roman Catholics and Jews. He was peppered with religious, religious petitions and memorials. A definitive total is beyond calculation, but the Lincoln Papers contain well over a hundred from a wide range of denominations and opinion. They emanated from across the North, not simply the anti-slavery heartland of New England. Lincoln took them seriously and discussed some with his cabinet. If he did not pore over every word of the petitioner's resolutions, he read enough to weigh their arguments. During the early months of the war, the memorials chiefly declared uncomplicated loyalty in the face of iniquitous rebellion. But increasingly, as I've already noted, the events of war turned into ardent emancipationists, those whose pre-war dislike of slavery had been checked by political respect for slaveholders' constitutional rights. These memorials served a further purpose. In offering a Christian interpretation of the nation's purpose, they provided the president with a compelling supplement to the more secular-minded nationalism that since the 1830s had marked his public explanations of the, the country's historic role. The petitioner's God was an all-seeing active force in history, ready to dispense retributive justice on a sinful people and delinquent nation, but equally ready to sustain human efforts when directed to a righteous end. Lincoln was not deaf to their arguments. Their ideas worked with the grain of his residual Calvinism. In particular, the memorial's providentialism complemented his wartime ruminations on the workings of providence. Before the war, Lincoln regarded providence as a superintending but remote force, working predictably within the rules of the universe that the Almighty had created. But during the war, Lincoln's providence became a more personal God, intrusive, active, judgmental, mysterious, and less predictable. In this intellectual shift, Lincoln drew closer to a colorblind theology of divine intrusion, one that shaped the religious understandings of both white and black emancipationists. The person he would call my friend, Frederick Douglass, scornful though he was of white supremacist religion, believed profoundly in God's intervention in history. The narrative of Exodus, the warnings of Jeremiah, and the wisdom of, of Isaiah were fundamental to his creed, even more than the secular enlightenment. When Douglas's superlative recent biographer, David Blight, labels him the prophet of freedom, he means it in an authentic biblical sense. Douglas turned to the Hebrew prophets to define the meaning of American exiles, uh, African Americans' exile and suffering under slavery, the bloody carnage of civil war, the raising of black regiments to crush sinful rebellion, and the pursuit of renewal in the reconstructed nation. Lincoln himself explained that from the beginning he had seen that the issues of our great struggle depended on the divine interposition and favor. If we had that, all would be well. In possibly the most significant of all White House meetings with clergy in September 1862, this is a few days before he made public his emancipation proclamation, the president tussled with the question of how a nation and its rulers should work in harmony with the government and providence of Almighty God. With a deputation representing Chicago emancipationists of all Christian denominations, he discussed the practical difficulties in the way of emancipation and how to reach a right view of the question. When the visitors remarked that they appealed to the intelligence of the president and to his faith in divine providence, Lincoln replied, unless I am more deceived in myself than I often am, it is my earnest desire to know the will of providence in this matter. And if I can learn what it is, I will do it. He spoke not simply as a leader burdened by secular duty, but as one acknowledging his responsibilities to an almighty who ruled human actions. Lincoln's encounter with the Chicago ministers reassured him that he could rely on the mainstream Protestant churches as political engines of progressive religious nationalism. In the event, their insistence on the inspirational effect of an emancipation edict proved accurate enough, evident in the subsequent flow to Washington of exultant church petitions and memorials, extolling a proclamation that in purifying the war and the nation opened the way to victory. The celebration of the Emancipation Proclamation by the Protestant mainstream colored the political response. 
Republican Unionist presses presented what was technically a weapon of war as a moral initiative, evidence of the Union's righteousness. What for many gave the edict its fearful potency was its closing sentence in which Lincoln had invoked the gracious favor of Almighty God upon an act of justice warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity. The Chicago Tribune welcomed, a, celebrated a welcome recognition of the finger of God in the affairs of nations, an acknowledgement that the cause which wins an enduring, an enduring victory must be that which has set upon it the seal of the everlasting right. This is just to reassure you that we are now entering the latter stages, but not the end of this sermon. In the old days, the audience would throw oranges at the preacher when he got to the halfway point, which is about two and a half hours in, but I'm not <laughs> expecting you to do the same. Okay, loyalist churchgoers described themselves as large, large tent patriots, aligned with both Republicans and war Democrats in support of the administration. However, a continuing Democratic Party opposition remained strong in the country at large. It played on the deep racial fears surrounding emancipation, attacked the government for its assault on civil liberties, blamed the lack of military progress on political incompetence, and exploited a deepening war weariness to demand a peace that would restore the old slaveholding union. The Democrats' political agenda and arguments are familiar, yet religious en energies too, ideological and institutional, drove their wartime momentum. Opposition polemics expressed the ethical and religious nationalism of Lincoln's critics, who saw themselves as keepers of the true faith in the face of a perverted religion, fanatical and diabolic. The Democratic Party was a fractious amalgam of purist peace advocates who insisted in the words of Ohio, an Ohio editor that he who supports the war is against the Union, and self-styled realists who believed that only by military force could the nation be saved. The political animosity between peace Democrats, so-called copperheads, and war-supporting but anti-emancipationist Democrats diverts attention from the equally important evidence of what they held in common. Both elements robustly defended the Union as it was, a loose-limbed ethical community of autonomous states protectors of citizens' freedoms against the coercive appetites of centralized power and upholders of a racial order that asserted the God-given primacy of white people. The interpenetration of religious and political nationalism among Lincoln's opponents was evident from the outset. Dissident voices challenged Lincoln's resort to arms and his use of expansive executive power in summoning volunteers suspending the writ of habeas corpus in designated areas and setting up a naval blockade of the Confederate States. A peace-minded minority formed the nucleus of that opposition. Clement Vallandigham of Ohio predicted that sober second thought would subdue the surging sea of madness. He and other voices of resistance, too fragmented at first to constitute a movement, fashioned religious and political imperatives that would give coherence to the growing ranks of peace Democrats during 1863 and 1864. They included James McMaster, Catholic editor of the New York Freeman's Journal, Henry Clay Dean, Methodist preacher, barnstorming orator, and former chaplain to the US House of Representatives, and the maverick Reverend Chauncey C. Burr, a gifted editor, each was tuned to Vallandigham's ethical and political wavelength. Vallandigham, an Ohioan of uh, Flemish Huguenot ancestry, absorbed the piety of his Scots-Irish mother and rectitude of a strict Calvinist father. At Dayton's First Presbyterian Church, he embraced a premillennialist faith that challenged the prevailing optimistic belief of postmillennialist reformers that society would be perfected before, not after, Christ's thousand-year reign. During the war, Vallandigham quoted purposefully from the scriptures. Belief in his personal destiny under God's guidance made him resilience, resilient against attack. A political ally attributed his moral courage to a deep vein, 
of piety. He believed that there was a right side and a wrong side to everything, that God ruled the world and provided for the ultimate triumph of the right. This explained the unswerving faith with which he stuck to his political convictions. Democrats found support across the denominational spectrum for their conservative nationalist vision. They commanded the overwhelming majority of Irish and German Catholic voters, and in many parts of the Lower North, where Peace Democrats were strongest, Protestant churches harbored significant Copperhead and pro-Southern sentiment. Sometimes the disaffected drew attention by their silence. Ministers avoided, ministers avoided taking the oath of allegiance, prayer, where they withheld prayers for the nation, and they failed to display the flag. Openly critical ministers were expelled and churches were seriously split. New Copperhead churches sprang up. Conservative religious nationalists clustered within traditions long contemptuous of what they called unscriptural Puritan meddling in the lives of others. They raged against the presumptuousness of human effort in the face of God's sovereignty and predetermined plan. They asserted the primacy and privacy of personal devotion. They scoffed at the mistaking of political platforms for religious truth. They gave full vent to their conservatism in upholding the scriptural authority for human enslavement. Where, they asked, where do the Christian scriptures pronounce slaveholding a sin? Nowhere. Yet if Jesus Christ and his apostles were on earth now, they would be denounced as traitors and sympathizers with rebellion. There was no more powerful critic of reform-driven Protestantism than the Ohio congressman Samuel Sullivan Cox. Cox, himself a staunch Presbyterian, responded to emancipation with a trenchant assault on what he called the bigots of New England. In a popular public lecture, he traced the history of early New England, so frequently thrust into the faces of other people as the only type of what is liberal, humanitarian, and pious, to denounce its arrogant, selfish, narrow, and Puritan policy now dominant in the federal government. The Pilgrim Fathers came hither to escape persecution, and when they came, what did they do? They persecuted those who dissented from them. Its ruling element present always the same selfish, pharisaical, egotistic, and intolerant type of character. Abolition, Cox declared, is the offspring of Puritanism. Until abolition arose, arose the Union was never seriously menaced. Puritanism introduced the moral elements involved in slavery into politics, and thereby threw the church into the arena. Our Christianity became a wrangler about human institutions. Churches were divided and pulpits desecrated. Speculative discussion about a higher law than the organic political law poisoned politics and begat asperities of sections. Copperhead's theology provided moral grounding for the deep racial antipathies of white northerners, of many white northerners. An Indianapolis Catholic, while acknowledging that the church placed all humanity on an equality before God, asked rhetorically, who will assert that the church as such has ever attempted to place all men without regard to races on an equality in social, political, and civil positions? That inquiry drew only one answer from James McMaster, who holding that slaves are of a race marked by God himself for inferiority in the social hierarchy, lamented that the bloody work of an almost pernicious, of a most pernicious philanthropism threatens to destroy the Negro on this continent by throwing him out of his providential place and thrusting him into a state of life where he cannot long exist. Another berated Lincoln for striving to make the war a conflict between the white and black race. How long would the Caucasian man allow this blasphemy to go out into the, the, to the nations that God and the Negro are to save the Republic? The lament became even more anguished as Union military campaigns evolved into a hard war against Southern civilians and black troops joined the federal front line. Pious Democrats rebuked the administration for its bloodthirstiness. Instead of feeding your people with the bread of life, you feed them with blood and gunpowder. Christian ethics, McMaster insisted, have settled that you cannot plunder the private property of the people of the states with which you go to war. Christian civilization has made all people, the people of all Christian states, brethren. Attack governments, attack armed forces, but the non-combatant people are not the spoil of any power. 
according to the code of Christian civilization. Central to the religious indictment of the Union leadership was its assault on constitutional rights. The torrent of criticism that engulfed the administration for suspending habeas corpus, relying on military courts, closing disloyal news newspapers, was notable as much for its moral fury as its legal argument. Lincoln was charged with a sacrilegious betrayal of America's providential role as the repository of individual freedom, civil and spiritual. When Union loyalists secured the imprisonment without charge of Edson B. Olds, an Ohio State congressman and Methodist lay preacher, and denied him his Bible, a democratic chorus rebuked a government as ungodly as it was tyrannical. Personal liberty was a peculiarly Christian idea, born of the worth of the human soul. Henry Clay Dean, Dirty Dean as he was known, imprisoned for denouncing Lincoln and the war, was adamant that personal rights could be suspended only by the fiat of the deity. The North was being forced to fight for a pagan idea that the man was nothing, the empire of the state was all in all. Common men, com copperheads commonly characterized the course of the wartime union as a form of dementia. It had succumbed to the nightmare of a militarized, tyrannical state driven by a self-righteous and insane religious sectarianism. The nation is unquestionably mad, asserted David Quinn, a, a Chicago lawyer, who blamed it on the mesmerizing or magnetic effect of demons working on the minds of spiritualists and religious sectarians. Quinn cast the president as the chief perverter of government. He had been selected by diabolical spirits for the work of equalizing white men and Negroes. Mr. Lincoln and his cabinet are now holding spiritual circles in the presidential mansion and consulting spirits in regard to the war. He has been directing the war under the direction of spirit wrappings. Lincoln himself, as the embodiment of the administration's moral failings, took a prime place in the demonology of pious Democrats. Steeped in vulgarity and obscenity, the president was accused of spreading a fetid moral atmosphere. He had sodomized the nation, turning Washington into a den of indecency and vice, encouraging prostitution, rape, and miscegenation in the train of federal armies. The agent of domineering and intolerant Puritanism, he was obscene, treacherous, lying, and devilish. The salient features of the Democrats' brand of religious nationalism assumed graphic form in the work of Adalbert John Folk. Oh, sorry, I've done Sunset Cox, Edson Olds. Well, yeah. Um, uh, Folk was a German born Baltimorean. And he produced dozens of etchings. Um, worship at the North, I think, that's a, I think that's a better image, yeah, yeah. Worship at the North cast the Union's war as a diabolical and uh, apocalyptic betrayal of Christianity. The word ego frames the top corners to argue that undisciplined individualism has led the Union to disaster. The North's political and religious leaders idolize a black figure squatting on the Republican Party's platform of 1860. The cloven-footed altar is inscribed, the end justifies the means, and bears the head of a devilish Lincoln. Puritanism is the foundation stone of a sacrificial block whose upper tiers incorporate the fanatical creeds of the North, atheism, rationalism, witch burning, socialism, spirit wrapping, and free love. Capping these mad corruptions is the headstone Negro worship. The sacrificial offering is a slaughtered white man. Henry Ward Beecher wields the knife. I'm looking at you, Richard. <laughs> Illuminated by a blazing torch held by Charles Sumner. A separate pedestal supports the statue of John Brown holding a pike. Worshippers include the Emancipationist commanders, John C. Fremont and David Hunter. In prayer, Harriet Beecher Stowe kneels on a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Hor Horace Greeley swings a censer emitting burning snakes. The figures of Seward and Stanton denote the sanction of Lincoln's cabinet. A distant ruined church, a vulture circling above it, signals the willful destruction of orthodoxy. A ghostly 
apocalyptic horseman crosses the sky. Folks' etching reveals the moral drama of the Civil War North, a collision between irreconcilable forms of religious nationalism. The religious voices of wartime conservative nationalism shaped Democrats' messaging and political mobilization, but their very diversity reduced their potential. The embedded cultural hostility to Romanism gave little hope that Catholics and anti-Lincoln dissenting Protestants would bond cooperatively as democratic allies in the larger cause. The internal party conflict between peace and war Democrats also limited the cohesion that their shared religious definitions of national purpose invited. The Union Party, by contrast, enjoyed the dynamic interdenominational mobilization of mainstream Protestants in the name of national righteousness. That moral drama reached its climax in the war's defining election, the contest of 1864, where the choice lay between, on one side, George McClellan, an armistice, a fractured union, a halt to emancipation, and on the other side, Abraham Lincoln, unyielding unionism and an amended anti-slavery federal constitution. Faced with those alternatives, the leaders of institutional Protestantism mostly trumpeted the cause of the president's re-election. A triumphant editor wrote, then there probably never was an election in all history into which the religious element entered so largely and so nearly all on one side. Majorities of the big evangelical denominations together with Quakers, Unitarians, and other liberal Protestant groups stood behind Lincoln. McClellan retained the Democrats' hold on most Catholic voters he won many Episcopalians and old school Presbyterians, as well as Baptists, Methodists, and disciples in the lower Midwest. But most Protestant churches found their center of gravity within the Union Party. Infusing a defense of lawful government against sinful rebellion with a vision of a new moral order, Protestants gave heightened millennialist meaning to the nation. Theodore Tilton attributed God's victory to an overruling divine hand outstretched to save the Republic. More prosaically, we can, see it, we can see in it an extraordinary mobilization of a potent brand of religious nationalism by the leaders of mainstream Protestant churches. At Lincoln's second inauguration, he addressed those millennial hopes. Although his speech was designed to promote a, a post-war reconciliation, which might seem to imply that moral absolutes would not serve the nation well, in fact, his words made clear he would resist any ethically neutral plan for the country's direction. We should recall his words with firmness in the right. As God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we have done. Well, we are in, I should say. And all parties had a duty to seek God's help in understanding what was right. Well, how exactly did Lincoln see the right? We can only speculate, of course, but there are clues. During his final six weeks of his life, he worked to block the conservative initiatives in Louisiana and breathe life into schemes for freedmen's education and civil rights. More widely, he saw in black votes the means of building loyal majorities across the South. At the White House on the 11th of April, he addressed a crowd who had come to celebrate Lee's surrender at Appomattox. Lincoln shared their joy and then swiftly turned to discuss Reconstruction. He declared his preference for conferring the vote on two classes of African Americans, the very intelligent and those who serve our cause as soldiers. Lincoln ended this, his last public address, saying, it may be my duty to make some new announcement to the people of the South. I shall not fail to act when satisfied that action will be proper. Was he moving in a more conservative direction or in the more aggressively radical direction of full suffrage for freedmen and the confiscation of rebels' land? In the crowd was one determined the president should not have the opportunity to choose. John Wilkes Booth took Lincoln's words to be heralds of a world turned upside down. From their post-war zenith, with emancipation won, post-millennial progressive nationalists would retreat in the face of resurgent conservative religious nationalism. 
as the future of freed men and women, their social and political rights as citizens, their opportunities in the labor market, as those issues became the coin of political contention, the religious champions of a racially progressive nationalism struggled to hold their political ground. The hopes of a radical reconstruction flickered and were eventually extinguished as northern religious conservatives ceded the South to the religion of the lost cause. No one better understood the interplay of these religious nationalist forces and the potential weakness of racial progressives than Frederick Douglass. Reflecting on Lincoln's emancipation edict, he had declared, I believe in the millennium, the final perfection of the race, and hail the proclamation as one reason of the hope that is in me. But he told Rochester Methodists, it will not be strange if many northern men, accustomed to submission to the slave power, continue their ancient civility long after their old master slavery is in his grave. Pride of race, prejudice of color, will raise their hateful clamor for the oppression of the Negro as heretofore. The slave having ceased to be the abject slave of a single master, his enemies will endeavor to make him the slave of society at large. Therein lay a continuing struggle, and it is not over yet. Thank you. Questions, Joe? Um, I'm loud. I thought so. Is that Natalie? Yeah. Um, people hear me? Yeah. Um, thank, thank you very, very much, much for this. this. And what, what came, came to mind at, at the beginning, beginning of the talk, and I waited to see if you would raise it, um, was the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And I wondered how this figured into your discussion of religious nationalism. Um, I was looking up the lyrics on my phone as you were speaking. Um, as someone who is not Christian and who has mixed feelings about American patriotism and nationalism, um, I nonetheless can't get away from the lyric that says, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. So could you say perhaps a little bit about um, the creation of that song and its adoption as the Battle Hymn of the Republic and how it was received both by Union soldiers and the wider Union public? Yeah, you saw me smiling at Adam uh, as you were asking the question because um, Adam uh, very, very kindly, kindly um, <clears throat> brought, brought together, together um, a panel for a uh, discussion of that um, on the podcast at the RAI. And I'm sure Adam will be really too pleased that I, uh, I mentioned the podcast series. Um, and um, uh, the, the chief contributor to that discussion was John Stauffer uh, of Harvard, um, a lovely book on the battle hymn. Um, in, in, in swiftly, uh, uh, the the uh, the tune John Brown's body was well was being sung. But John Brown's body was being sung by troops, and a number of people thought it would be terrific if only we had if we had better words <laughs> to that. Um, um, given the, the answer, that, particularly sort of the ambivalent attitudes towards John Brown, and um, Julia Wardhouse is not the first to, um, to to write an alternative, but the the most superior of all the alternatives. Um, and uh, she was uh, uh, conscious of the, the camps and the uh, close to the Potomac, uh, the military camps. And she went to bed one night and she often uh, would get up in the, the half light of, of, of dawn and, and scribble. And on this occasion, the whole, the whole thing came to her in, a, in a, almost a, like a, a moment of divine inspiration. Um, she certainly, we, see the, we can see the original uh, penciled lines, uh, she, and very, very few changes were made between that and what was eventually published. Um, and it is, absolutely, it is a, a, a hymn of uh, Christian 
nationalism, um, Christian patriotism, um, the line as, um, uh, as, as Christ, was, Christ was born again amongst the lilies, uh, um, um, let, us, let us die to make men free, um, that subsequently, of course, let us live to make men free in post-Civil War settings. Um, very powerful. Um, it, it, it's, uh, as I've sometimes said, it, it's, uh, it's the, it's the, um, it's the counter-argument to the statement that the devil has all the best tunes. It's, uh, it just is a it is just a fantastic tune, um, and uh, it spoke. I think, uh, although it is an, an explicitly Christian lyric, I think it sp spoke the larger. Uh, a moral sentiment and Christian sentiment of what was, after all, overwhelmingly a Christian society, uh, even if um, not all were technical Christians and if there were a few atheists, but of course also Jews. Um, so, uh, but it, it, it has a very, very powerful resonance. And that's, so that's how it came about. Julia Ward Howe, aware that there, there would, this was a fantastic tune, it could, be, it could work even better <laughs> with better lyrics. And um, uh, it, it, it took off from there, um, and um, was, I think, was widely was widely sung. Um, there are um, later when Paul Robeson came to sing um, later in the twentieth century, he sang John Brown's Body, <laughs> as you might imagine. Yeah. Richard, thank you so much for a wonderful talk. You've given us all so much food for thought. Um, I wondered if you might say a little bit more about sort of the prehistory of the Copperhead theology that you mentioned. And I ask this because it strikes me that it's very familiar to a strand of kind of anti-war Anglican thought. Um, in, in Anti-war? Anti-war Anglican thought. In yeah, Anglican thought, yes. Yeah. I'm thinking specifically of the Society for Promoting the Cessation of Hostilities yeah. in the United States. Right. And it seems like that, that language is very, and, and, and the, the theological arguments they make for peace are very sort of instrumental and, and kind of disingenuous. And I wondered if, if there's something similar happening with, with Copperheads or if, if this has a, a prehistory that we need to consider. No, I, I think you're absolutely right in your implication, which is that this is a contingent pacifism. Um, it's not, I think, a deeply principled pacifism. Um, it's a useful argument to use. It, I mean, we, there, there were, of course, as you'll be well aware, there were true principled pacifists during the war, and um, the war um, exposed the, the real tension that exists within um, the, the Friends community, where you've got these two powerful principles they both stand for. One is for pacifism and the other is anti-slavery. And, and Lincoln recognized that. He's, he understood the trials of conscience that uh, principal pacifists faced. And he did intervene, um, perhaps not as much as they wanted, but he did intervene at times to, to propitiate uh, them, to, to, to help um, steer principled pacifist Quakers away from the front. But I think the... Um, the Copperhead pacifism is utterly um, civil war contingent. Um, it's, um, uh, it, 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 it's fashioned um, uh, not by people who have previously been connected with pacifist movements. Um, they understand pa pacifist theology, but that's not where they're really coming from. So it's a useful, you know, reach me down um, theology, take it off the shelf and bring it into, into use. I don't think it, I don't think it um, reduces the fervor with which they deploy it and the sense in which they come to internalize it, um, but it is, I think, utterly instrumental um, rather than something that uh, comes from within, um, uh, that comes from within. Thank you. Forgive me, I'm a bit nervous. Normally I wait for everybody else to raise their hand and then time runs out and I never get to ask my question. Um, but you mentioned mass baptisms yeah. and um, that's just an incredibly intriguing 
string of words. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about that um, and religious conformity and also religious fervor leading into patriotism, how that impacted um, troops as they're going into war, and as well as how this um, sort of contested space of like religious interpretations and scripture, um, the role of white benevolence, um, as well as um, abolition translates into um, did it, oh, sorry. Translates into uh, reconstruction. Um, so, can you continue your narrative into reconstruction? <laughs> Not just scratch the surface. Maybe we can talk at the at the yeah, hog roast. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> he's wielding the knife. <laughs> uh, uh, swiftly, I was just we will talk about uh, the, the big issues you raised there. Um, the mass baptisms. Um, uh, in, in both arts, particularly in southern armies, actually, um, um, but they are known in the north. There are revivals, revivals in both armies. Um, uh, the role of chaplains is important. In cha chaplains, um, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole literature on um, citizen soldiers, Christian soldiers, um, chaplains who fight, chaplains who are acting uh, simply in a, in a pastoral way. Um, there's a whole literature on um, white benevolence during the war beyond mere anti-slavery, the whole role of the United States um, Sanitary Commission, the United States Christian Commission. There's a whole story of female Christianity. I mean, the mo pretty well everybody that I cited here was male because they dominate the editorial, they dominate the pulpits. But there, there are, there are um, of course, female abolitionists. They visit Lincoln, progressive the progressive friends. Um, so um, uh, w w women are hugely involved in the unit, uh, the sanitary commission, and the, and the Christian commission. So, um, uh, so that's just, just a few answers to your question. There is a white benevolence beyond anti-slavery. Um, there are mass baptisms. There are mass revivals. There are conversions. Um, it's not surprising that in wartime people um, and the Christian people think very much about um, uh, ultimate things. Uh, and the state of their soul, and, and uh, letters from troops to their loved ones back home, and vice versa, um, right regularly and frequently address issues of uh, the next life. Um, um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I, I was quite struck when you were talking about the uh, democratic um, um, uh, conservative religious nationalists um, by the use of the phrase uh, Christian civilization. And it made me think of um, McClellan's Harrison Landing yeah. Yeah. letter. And I'm, the, the, the question is, um, does that imply that the term um, Christian civilization was effectively a code word that was understood within the kind of culture war that you're describing? Was it a, was it a code word that denoted in shorthand the conservative religious nationalist perspective you're describing? And the second question is, why did uh, Henry uh, Clay Dean, wh wh why was he known as dirty? <laughs> it, it wasn't to do with his sense of humor. Um, it was more to do with his physical appearance. Um, and uh, uh, he was disheveled. I think disheveled would have been a better adjective than, than dirty, but he was known as Dirty Dean. Yeah. That's a simple answer to the straightforward question. Um, uh, I don't think that, um, well, I think it, it, the, the term Christian civilization was highly contextual. And I don't think it was a, in, an, in and of itself a code. I think it, it just grows out of um, a, a broader discussion of what the true Christian, the, and you're right in saying that, you're absolutely right in, in drawing attention to McClellan's use of that term. Um, it's to do with um, a piety that is respectful of human beings. Um, and the true Christian is respectful of human beings. Um, there are horrors in war, but we must avoid them as far as possible. And uh, uh, that, I think, is what, they're, is what they're saying. I don't think it's a code for 
um, for white Christian. I, I th don't think it's a don't think it, I don't think it is a, a code in that sense, but it is a summation of the, the various elements that I, I describe. I, I, like you, find that, I mean, I have found exploring Confederate religion fascinating um, uh, when it tries to get into the minds of people who's, they're, 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 that they are driven by um, a, a powerful racial prejudice is undoubted. I mean, that's, that's, that's un undoubtedly sort of front and center in their, uh, in their propaganda. But I do think we miss something very, very important if we simply say of Copperheads, um, and Peace Democrats, that they were simply racist. They are driven by a profound sense of mystification that the world should move in an emancipationist direction. The four million unlettered slaves being brought into, into freedom this is just madness. Um, and uh, so their, their, their use of Christianity, I don't think, I think we, we, uh, we make a big mistake if we think that's simply a rationalization. Um, uh, they feel themselves to be ethically grounded. That, I, I quoted Quinn, the Chicago lawyer, when he puts it down to the result of spirits infecting the brain, demons infecting. But there is this sense that... Um, these emancipationist nationalists have really just they've just gone off the, ro the rails. They're completely wonky. Um, they're, 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 they've totally derailed the American experiment. Um, and uh, I think we, 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 we don't do them a disservice when we expose their racial prejudices, but we do them a disservice, I think, if we don't recognize that they saw their position as being one of, morally, of moral superiority over the emancipationist nationalist. Um, and I, I th as I said, you know, I, th I think we, we need to remember that there were a lot of Democrats <laughs> and that Catholicism and this kind of um, uh, Protestantism, conservative Protestantism, is a formidable force. It would have been even more formidable if there hadn't been those fractures within it of anti-popery on the Protestant side and so forth. But, but it's a, it's a powerful force, and it's still there at the end of the war. And it, it's that, together with the giving the South the cultural space to develop the lost cause, that means these three elements in the war, Southern, Nas Southern Christian nationalism, Northern conservative nationalism, and emancipatory nationalism, means that emancipatory nationalism wins out in the war. The war crystallizes um, the Northern mind around the majority, eventually the, northern, the majority of the northern mind are around that. But it doesn't survive very long after the war. It dissipates, and you've left, left with these two fundaments of southern conservative religion and northern conservative religion. Um, and as Douglas, Douglas wasn't referring specifically to that when he said we need to remember that Emancipation is not an end. There will continue to be those who continue to see us as slaves, even if we are slaves no longer. And I think he's right. I would like to thank Richard Bernard for I'd like to thank Richard for a wonderful paper to end the conference on. We do have to get moving. I'm told that the hog is getting dry. <laughs> so we need to hustle up double time to get there. But can we all give a round of applause for Richard Carter?